Hi, it's Tim Hargadon, and welcome to another featured keynote speaker for the 2017 Tiny House Summit. Today we've got Andrew Bennett from Trucker Trailers. Andrew, welcome. Hey, Steve. How you doing, man? I'm good, and thanks so much for doing this. I, I've seen Andrew live in action at different events, I think now three times, and I just love his perspective. I'm really glad he's here today, and Andrew, I'm just going to let you go forward. Cool. Well, thanks again. Listen, uh, first of all, I'm really honored to be a part of this. Anytime I can share what I consider the valuable thing that I bring to the table um, with more than just one person in front of me, which is great. Um, if we can broadcast that across the world um, and it helps somebody, it really excites me, you know, and I've had those opportunities several times now. And, and man, I just, I just eat it up because I know what, uh, this industry and this lifestyle has meant to me and my family. And uh, I just, you know, like anytime, anything we find, uh, like even when we find a great restaurant, we can't wait to tell other people about it. Well, this has a little more impact than a great restaurant, but the same concept. So um, let me just start a little bit with my story. I mean, listen, this whole tiny concept, I mean, we didn't invent it. I mean, let's just be realistic about it. Uh, my wife and I started living tiny about, 18 years ago, you see, we would buy these um, vintage homes, our restored vintage homes for many years. And I mean, some of them as old as 1865. I mean, we're in Florida, so we don't have that many old ones. But um, man, I just really, I loved it. I loved, first of all, the craftsmanship of it. I love to see that something was put together without caulking, without pressure treated wood, without all the stuff we have today, that's still here, you know, 100, 200 years later. And I like to see why. How was that? I like to see the craftsmanship behind it. A lot of it that I found was just the pride of ownership. You know, it's the pride of, hey, I'm building a house I want to live in and hand down to my family. It's not something I need to make a big chunk of cash on. And um, that really intrigued me. And it really gave me a sense of, um, of pride in everything that I do. It made me realize if I want to do, if I'm going to do something, I want to do something that's going to last. Um, so what was really cool is, we started out typical young, just newlywed family uh, uh, couple and buying these houses. And of course, we had the big dreams, these big, beautiful houses. And we'd buy them and fix them up. And they were gorgeous, beautiful homes. They'd be featured in magazines and historic walks and so forth. And um, well, it, there would always be like a big attic space or a basement or an outbuilding or something that it was just like, man, we got to think of something cool to use that space for. And I would always build it out into like this little micro living quarters. And uh, the one I remember specifically was probably my favorite one, had this attic. And, um, you know, they had the knee wall coming down. So you couldn't really walk on all parts of it. But it made a nice little 300 square foot apartment. And um, the only part you can really stand up in all the way was just down the four foot center the whole length. And uh, it was it was so cute, though. I even put a full size fireplace in it. But we were going to rent it out to help pay the mortgage. And we decided, let's just move in there and rent out the house. And that was what started us on this little micro living concept. And, you know, of course, because we were living in the little attic apartment and renting out the house, man, we were cash flowing. I mean, we were making a lot of money on that. So we did it again and did it again. And eventually we had these properties built up with these cute little guest houses um, the appraisal values are going through the roof uh, because of it, and it freed up a lot of time and a lot of finances for us to really pursue the things that were important to us. Um, you know, if, we're, uh, if your living expenses are so low, um, you know, we don't face it. We don't live for the concept of paying for a house. That's not our life's goal. I don't know anybody who has that as a life goal. Our life goals are to experience people, um, experience the world travel you know talk to retired people that all say the one thing i wished i had done is done all this stuff earlier instead of waiting until i was too old you know and that was really the advice that set us up you know i went and um a guy that's been like a dad to me uh, my father died when i was young but this guy kind of stepped up and been like a father to me forever and uh, i took him out to lunch one day i said hey um listen jack you know you're a lot like me you know what i'm all about what would you do different he said do whatever it takes to travel i said i think i can do that so i went home and told my wife at the time hey we're gonna you're gonna quit your job and i'm gonna sell the business we're gonna go travel she goes no we're not i like my job uh, so it took a little while like uh, exactly it was a year a year to the date of uh actually pulling out in our in our rv at the time is what we had available 
So uh, we did that. But listen, living tiny allowed us the opportunity to do this. We didn't have to work. You know, we weren't independently wealthy, but we lived, you know, well below our means. So at late 20s, early 30s, we got to travel. We've toured Scotland, England, uh, been to Africa twice. I've been to Zambia, uh, Mexico a few times, Haiti, little island in Canada. We toured the country in an RV for two years here, which how many people, that's like the American dream. Come on, you know, tour the country in an RV, all the movies, all the all the uh, you know that's just the thing you know you live in America we got the you know one of the biggest most beautiful countries in the world um, and you know so many people don't get to see it or experience it the really cool thing is the people that are in those areas because you'll notice we I mean we're a melting pot you don't have just one kind of culture we have so many subcultures within this country that you can spend your whole life traveling and visiting these people and never never exhaust it I mean it's just it seems endless so we're able to do that, you know, many of you have heard of the Appalachian Trail, right? The, you know, the trail that goes from Georgia to Maine, it's uh, tw over 2,100 miles. We had never backpacked before, but we had the time, so we went out and hit the trail for, we made it 700 miles. It was quite a life-changing experience. Again, the people we were able to meet on the trail and experience, you know, where they're from and get to know them, it was really the, it was really the, um, I wouldn't say a culture shock, but it was the the culture exposure, if you will, it just uh, let us know that there's a lot more to the world than just what we're sitting on our couches seeing on TV. And this is what Tiny meant to us. This is what living minimally meant to us. And we kind of just fell into it. There wasn't like a movement going or an industry of living tiny. It was, we just thought the apartment was cute. And then we, it just kind of snowballed into this whole lifestyle, you know, and now we have little kids I have a, a eight-year-old and a three-year-old. They're both adopted, um, and now we're fixing to do it again. We're actually going to build, build ourselves another little tiny, and uh, not an RV this time. We're actually going to. I'm going to build one. As you can see, I got a shop. By the way, welcome to Trekker Trailers. This is <laughs> this is this is my magic kingdom right here. So this is where. Uh, I, here's a cool thing. Just side note, I actually when I'm designing stuff and planning things in small spaces. I'll actually get inside once we build the show. Like I'll get inside that that um, gypsy wagon and I'll think inside the box of how I can maximize on that box. And that's what I, I do it on everything. I've been doing it since I started doing this and I'd get the little square campers and I would literally sit in there for hours and think, man, what is the maximum use I can make of this space? So I call it my thinking inside the box. But yeah, it really what it does is it opens up a world. So um that's that's really how we started in the tiny industry um, or in the tiny lifestyle rather personally now as far as starting in the tiny industry um, I uh, in the market in 08 when the market crashed you know like everybody you know we took a big hit I mean I was heavy into the vintage homes and real estate and we pretty much lost everything we went from you know traveling the world and traveling the country and having lots of money to we had our first kid and we we're eating out of food pantries, you know, didn't even have a way to feed. So um, I saw a little tiny micro teardrop camper once and I thought I could build that better than anybody. So I took an old um, pop up camper frame and I built that thing, you know, in my driveway and uh, it came out really nice. And sure enough, people were looking at it going, wow, you should really get into doing this. And uh, about that time, the earthquake hit Haiti. So I sold that little teardrop camper out of my driveway and I used to do disaster relief. I had a team and a, a company I'd set up doing that myself. I was a combat engineer in the military. And uh, so I sold that and I used the money to take a team down to Haiti for some disaster relief. Took a team about 14 of us down there. And, uh, and I thought, man, there's, there's something to be said for this. There's something going on here. And I just grabbed hold of it. And uh, by the time I got back, I had, you know, uh, companies wanting to hire me to, to design and manufacture teardrops for them. So I started doing those. I've done over 100 of them so far, all custom. Um, I've got them from Puerto Rico to Washington State. They're all, they're all over the place. You'll see one going by once in a while with a trekker name on it. That's me. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so that's how I got into that is uh, building those little micro campers. And then when the, you know, I saw like one of Jay Schaefer's um, houses, I saw a little special or something on it. I forget exactly. And I thought, man, well, I've built lots of micro living quarters and I've built lots of campers. So perfect marriage, you know, and it fit right into, hey, I can actually encourage people with this to experience what I got to experience, my wife and I. 
And so I built the first one and it was, let me tell you what, it was tiny. It was, it was really small. It was literally 72 square feet of tiny house. Called it our little uh, beach cottage. But it came out so stinking cute. Again, everybody wanted it. I listed it and it's, it's it sold the day I listed it. I mean, I actually had people on the phone saying, I'm on my way. I'm two hours away. Oh, I'm on my way. I'm two and a half hours away. I said, well, you need to drive faster than this guy because he's coming. <laughs> so anyway, it sold that day, you know, for full price. And I thought, well, let me build another one and another one and another one. It just kind of snowballed. And, um, and uh, so we started getting into this a little more and then realized there wasn't really any kind of regulations or certifications or any kind of guidelines for building these. And uh, so I'm actually one of the founders of NOAA Certified. Um, and you guys can learn more about that if you go check it out. But we actually do have some certification programs available now for Tiny House. Uh, I think there's three of them now. Um, Steve is the, the NOAA Certified, and I think PWA has a has a home-built uh, DIYer program now. And RVIA, which had to be a manufacturer, but that's really for campers. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, when I was in California, where we meet, we met actually, um, was a couple of, was explaining they had their tiny house, RVI certified built and all that, and, and the, um, the, it burnt down. They had a, I don't know what the tragedy was, but they said it, it they didn't give me the details, but they said it actually caught fire and burnt down. Um, I don't know if it was the fault of how it was built, but the fact is it did, and then the insurance company said, hey, this is an RV, you weren't supposed to be living in it full time anyway, and they didn't have to pay the claim. So now the people were out their money, out their home, and out of their dream. So um, search it, you know, maybe there's a dual certification, but search and look into it, you guys. Um, you know, I can always answer questions about that, but I'm, I'm here to, to, to talk to you about why to do this and how to do this. Those are some things you're going to have to think about, so I don't want to just push it off to the side, but look into it. Definitely look into it if you're going to go tiny, especially if you're going to build your own, because you can get them certified and approved for proper insurances and stuff. So anyway, so back to, you know, my story of tiny, um, you know, the thing I, I could easily go back to just building stuff in my shop, cranking stuff out and making money at it. It's a lot of fun. I love doing it, but that's not going to help you guys at all if I just do that. And I mean, I've got a little bit of a legacy to live up to. Tell you some of my family history is uh, if you've ever used a thermostat like on your air conditioner or refrigerator or something like that, um, my mother's father invented that. Uh, he invented the bimetallic adjustable thermostat. I have a I keep a copy of it in my office back there to reference and inspire me. He also invented the steam iron. If you ever ironed your clothes with steam, uh, you used my grandfather's invention. My uh, my father, my real father. Um, who passed away when I was young, he actually helped develop some of the communication systems for uh, the USS Triton and submarines and stuff. Um, I have a National Geographic's uh, book that has a picture of my aunt and two of my cousins on the cover. Um, her, my uncle, their dad, was on the USS Triton and went around the world undetected. So I have that. Um, we had, Back to the Mayflower, we had people on the Mayflower. There's the story of the guy that fell off the Mayflower and caught the rope, you know, nautical miles were judged by they would let out a rope and count the knots, how many knots went out per time is how they came up with nautical miles. Well, he caught himself on that rope. So the story goes and he pulled himself up. Well, if he didn't, I wouldn't be here. So there's, uh, there's a long, there's a long history of things that, uh, that I feel like I got to kind of step up my game a little bit if I'm going to leave a legacy. And, um, I feel like that's really important for my kids, but I also feel like it's important for humanity. I mean, we all we all have something significant to offer that's going to help the world, you know. And if we just sit back and keep it to ourselves, sure, it'll help us. But listen, the world the world needs us to step up to the plate. The world needs, especially times like right now. I mean, there's a lot of struggle, a lot of strife, a lot of things going on in the world. And I've been around the world. I've seen it. But um, I think now is the time for us really to step up our game. Um, I think living tiny is really going to help this because it'll allow us that time and opportunity to step up our game, to explore those creative ideas, to explore, um, you know, what we're passionate about. You know, maybe you want to go on mission trips or maybe you want to, uh, you know, join a join a, a, a group that's, that's digging wells somewhere or, or just go spend time with people. I read a, a, a book called, um, I think it was Buddhist Boot Camp, 
And uh, I'm not Buddhist, but it was a good book anyway. But one thing in there really struck me as as uh, important, and I'll mention it now because I think it is important, is he said, you know, you can. Some people are creative at making money. Some people are really good at that, and that's the thing they need to focus on. Um, and that's great. Do that if that's your thing. But if it's not, don't waste your time trying to make that your thing because you think everybody's got to be successful monetarily. Um, he pointed out and he said, you know what? What if you could just live on three days of work a week, working a regular no thought job and spend the other time going to a nursing home or a foster home or something and just spend time with people? You know, time is the only thing you can't store up, you can't buy. Um, and if you have time to offer, that's as valuable or more valuable than if you have millions of dollars to offer. You know, somebody sitting alone, you know, dying in hospice or whatever, doesn't care if you send them 500 bucks. But it does mean a lot to them if you actually can come and hold their hand for a while and not feel like you got to get back to the office. I mean, this is this is important stuff, guys. I'm passionate about this. You know, I, I work a lot of hours. I really do. And I do it because I want to reach you guys. I mean, don't think I neglect my family. You know, if I'm here at night or on weekends and stuff, I'm still spending time with my family. I'll make up for that, you know, and, and a lot of times – I'll wait till my wife, my kids are already in bed and asleep, and I'll come back here. I'll come up in this shop, and I'll work, you know, four or five hours just through the night. It's not taken away from my time from everybody else, but I can still be productive and get something done that's going to change somebody else's life, you know. And it's it's funny because uh, sometimes, hey Bill, you know, sometimes it's funny when when you guys come in, and you'll notice I got a bunch of stuff done. You're like, oh, somebody couldn't sleep yeah. again. <laughs> So it's, it's it's kind of fun, you know. Fortunately, I don't require a whole lot of sleep, but I think it's you know it's the passion that motivates you, you know. And you see uh, people who are depressed without without a goal, without a vision, you know, they sleep a lot. Well, the opposite is true. If you have a lot of vision and a lot of goal, and you're really excited about life and what you're doing, you're not going to sleep a lot because you got a lot to do. So um, that's that's where I'm at, guys. And listen, I want to get a little bit into the technical stuff here. But, uh, I mean, that information's everywhere. I mean, information's everywhere. But I want to point out just a couple things. First of all, if you're going to build yourself, kudos to you. You're going to have a blast. You're going to have some pride of ownership. You're going to love this thing. You're going to give it to your kids or grandkids or whatever. Um, so I do encourage it. Don't fool yourself into thinking you're going to save a bunch of money by building your own. Um, professionals are professionals for a reason. You know, they can be a lot more efficient at getting the same job done. You know, if you make minimum wage somewhere, you're typically better off um, paying somebody, a professional, to do your tiny house build. But if you want to own that thing and you want the you want your hands and craftsmanship on it, by all means do. But seek the proper help. Ask questions. I mean, all of us, I mean, how many people we have on this this summit, Steve? We, we got like 20 people on this. Everybody wants to help. Everybody that knows something wants to wants to do something for all you guys out there we want to share with you everything we know. I don't withhold trade secrets. I've had other companies in my shops, you know, competitors, if you will, um, in my shops, and I tell them everything, you know, because if something I know is going to benefit the end user, I don't want to withhold that information because I want to monetize on it. So I don't hold anything back. Um, you know, a couple little things. I mean, like uh, like your foundation. You always can start with your your trailers, your foundation. Um, that's pretty darn important. Your foundation is the most important part of the whole house, really, because uh, I mean, if that's not going to hold up, the whole thing collapses. So um, it's not like building on a regular foundation either, like a concrete pad. Uh, when they pour those, you know, everything's flat and level and straight. Um, on a trailer, the thing's wiggling around. When they weld it, they heat the metal. You know, you always assume that steel is just going to be straight. Well, guess what? It isn't always. And uh, and I've posted some videos on what to check for and how to do that. We level those things up. A lot of people are putting those cranky jacks on each corner. You crank them up. Well, guess what? When they're up on those, you can still wiggle it around. So don't do that. Go ahead and build up. Um, use some cinder blocks. Use some two by sixes, whatever, and build up to each of those corners, and uh, get them all perfectly solid and then level. And um, that's going to help a lot. Also, if you put a string line across that top main beam of your of your trailer, you can tighten that up and see if that trailer dips down a little bit or if it's straight across. Very rarely are they perfectly straight across, and you have to shim those before you put your subfloor on. So you want to take the time uh, um, to really make sure your trail and your foundation is properly prepped to build on. Otherwise, everything's going to be out of whack. Your cabinets aren't going to sit right. Your walls aren't going to sit right. Your doors aren't going to shut right. 
Um, and also you want to make sure you're buying a trailer that's built and designed for a tiny house to be on it. Don't just buy a utility or cargo trailer. So take this. If you have a, um, if you have a, a, a cargo trailer, it's designed. It's got, let me grab a piece of, so you got this cargo trailer, right? And it's designed to carry 10,000 pounds, right? So it's designed to carry 10,000 pounds in the center, in the, in the load area. Okay, so your tiny house is built around the perimeter. So you don't care what it can haul in the middle of it. You want to make sure it's got the proper supports and outriggers to carry the load of an entire house around the perimeter. So if you look at a tiny house trailer, you'll notice there's a lot of, they, they don't look the same, first of all, and that should be your first clue. So you want to make sure you're buying from a company that knows what they're doing and designing a, a trailer that's, that's engineered to support its load capacity around the perimeter because that's where your house is going to be. So that's an important thing to make sure of. And, and I've helped other couples that actually bought like a car hauler trailer and stuff. And, and I was like, listen, just, just sell it, you know, take the hit and, and, you know, get the proper trailer. And it's, it's that important to do that. So um, other things are uh, when you're, let me grab my, if you are taking into consideration, you know, you know, house on foundation versus house built on, on a trailer. So you got a house on a foundation, you're building this thing, it's on the solid foundation. And so it's got to withstand, you got some uh, rain and you got some winds going um, in certain areas of the country might have a little earthquake, right? So imagine this thing. Now you got your foundation on these rubbery bouncy wheels and springs and you're going down the road. So you're going down the road at 70 miles an hour. Okay. Cause some of us do that. And uh, so you're on, you're going down there and you're bouncing around. So you got basically a 3.5 Richter scale earthquake. You got a 70 mile an hour hurricane wind coming at you and it starts raining. So now you're in a, you're in an earthquake and a hurricane at the same time on your little house going down the road, being pulled by your truck. So it's, it's a little bit of a game changer. Now here's another thing people don't consider. Now you're going to go around a curve and guess what? Now you've got some G forces to contend with, right? So that thing's going to have a centrifugal force that's going to try to, pull that thing out of shape and off the, the trailer or slide it out on the uh, highway. It's, it's something to take seriously and, and make sure you are taking those um, things into consideration and ask for help. Again, you know, my number's all over the place. Um, all these guys that are helping on this summit, every, everybody is more than willing to help you with that. And it's so important because we don't want to, um, one of the big fears in this, and I'm sure you guys have heard it and said it and or talked about it is, we're just don't the first time one of these is going down the highway and it, and it comes apart or something falls loose on it and kills somebody. That's that's our tragedy story. That's going to throw a big, big damper on the whole industry and a lot of people's dreams, you know, because fear will stop people. You know, it's just like people that don't get on an airplane. Oh, it might crash. I'm like, well, yeah, it might crash. You might slip in your bathtub, you know, 7000 times more often than in a, crashing in an airplane. So, but we've, it's the, it's the magnitude of that tragedy that, that scares us. So, um, in, in any tragedy where anybody's hurt or killed, it, it is, I don't care if it's one or, or a million, it's, it's a tragedy. So we want to make sure we're taking every precaution we can to keep our people and our industry safe. You know, just be smart. Don't, don't just throw stuff together. Um, Again, tons of resources. You won't lack for any resources out there. And be smart about it. Have somebody else. If you're not really sure about how this stuff works, have, have a friend or somebody you trust um, say, hey, can you look at this for me? Just give me an idea. Uh, recently, I was just um, doing, I drove up to Kentucky. I'm in Florida. Just drove up to Kentucky to help another builder. Builder's been building for a while. He knows how to build houses. He's like, you know what? I think I might be getting in over my head. So I said, well, let me come up and spend a week with you. So I went up there checked everything out. We worked, we knocked out a bunch of work. And then there was another young couple that was 30 minutes away that had called me up and said, Hey, you know, I hear you're in Kentucky. Can you swing by and just take a look at our plumbing? And you know, we, we want to help. I mean, we want to do that. So, I mean, I drove all the way up to Kentucky to do that. I've done it. I went to Cape Cod a month or so ago and did the same thing. I'll come to you and do the same thing. If you need help, you know, I'm on the phone. Um, but yeah, definitely look for those resources. Um, look into, NOAAcertified.org, uh, look into PWA, RVIA. I mean, that's only if you're a manufacturer. Um, and again, I don't recommend the RVIA. That's nothing against them. It's just a different industry. It's not what we're doing here. We're building homes, domiciles. This is your, your house. This is not a recreational vehicle. So um, there's all hey, that. Go ahead. So I've heard you talk several times, and each time 
there's like a crowd of people who want to talk to you afterwards. And I've seen you oh, stay yeah. for really some amount of time afterwards, making sure everybody's questions are answered. Yeah. What are the really common questions that people come up with right after you finish talking? Um, you know, actually, it's hard to remember them all, but uh, one of the things is solar. Everybody asks about solar panels. So let me hit on that a little bit. And, I, and I'm not real well versed on this. You want to talk to a professional about solar panels. Um, uh, so solar panels, okay, so our, I've built a bunch of these houses. The biggest, most elaborate one I've built so far, the highest electric bill it ever had was $28. So you want to keep things in perspective, all right? So to put that house on solar was about five grand. So it really wasn't cost effective because everywhere they went, they had electricity. My opinion on solar power is that um, if you have to have it, if you're just simply going to be in an area where you know you're not going to have it, not, oh, I'm going to be traveling and I may not have electricity every time, um, that can be contended with. If you know you're going to live somewhere off grid, then look into solar. And in, uh, in a tiny house is ideal for that because they're so efficient. I mean, not just the um, quality of the build that we're getting out there, but the um, cubic footage alone, just the size of it, lends itself to high efficiency. So, yeah, the solar panels are one. Um, and also, uh, as far as solar panels, a lot of people are like, oh, this roof is perfect for mounting solar panels on. Um, if you mount the solar panels on the roof, you're going to be limited to where you can position your house. So you may have a beautiful lake view or ocean view over here, but you have to turn your house the other way because the sun's coming from that direction. So I would say have something that's either adjustable like uh, we did one at the college up here at the uh, tiny house class at the engineer college and, and they made it where you can adjust it either way to, you know, to maximize on the position of the house. Um, my opinion is have it on a separate rack. It can roll around and just an accord that way you can actually be in the shade and have the panels over in the direct sunlight and position them. You can even move them at certain times of the day or seasons to max out on, on that, uh, the angles. So, Anyway, he'll be done drilling in just a second. Or I'll throw a piece of wood at him. Um, so yeah, that's my take on solar panels. Also, the weight. So if you get um, if you get if you get a uh, a bunch of batteries. So you, basically, you don't just have solar panels and that you plug your stuff into because the sun's not always shining. So you have solar panels and they go into a battery bank, which stores the energy that you're not using while they're charging in the sun. And then that battery bank supplies your power when you don't have good sun or at nighttime or whatever. Um, but the batteries are heavy. So um, you're going to add 1,000 pounds of weight to your tiny house um, if you're going to do a whole battery bank system. Hang on a sec. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> hey, he's just trying to get stuff done. You can't blame the guy. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Letson, our resident Vietnam veteran craftsman <laughs> so yeah so there's the the solar panel thing was was one of them um, another thing is the compost toilet a compost toilet and um, and here's my opinion on this and again I've, I've traveled I've been around the world I've actually taken my own toilet to other countries with me <laughs> my little <laughs> privy for our team and stuff because I've done a lot of extensive third world travel and stuff but um, so here's my opinion on that compost toilets are great if you're going to use the compost if you're going to be in a place where you have a compost bin that you can transfer that over to and continue the process and then use the compost later in your garden and stuff. Great idea. Great idea. Great for the environment. It's how God intended that stuff to work in my opinion. So, um, but if you're doing it just so you don't have to hook up the plumbing, you're, you still got to find somewhere to put that, that waste. You still have to have something to do with it. You don't want to just go spread it out because it still has to finish decomposing. Um, for it to be used as a compost. It doesn't all happen within the uh, toilet in the house. So, um, and, it, and it's also a cubic footage thing. Uh, because you're mixing it with the peat moss and sawdust and all that, you're using more space. Um, I have heard for people that, that are in situations where they just don't have plumbing and they're traveling or whatever, uh, make a, basically a kitty litter box. Um, it's, it's the same thing as compost toilet, but they use kitty litter instead. And they can just scoop it out. They're only throwing away what, what they have to at a time. And it keeps the smell down. And it's, uh, it's sanitary. And it, and it works really well. So I've heard that as a good one. Um, we use, like, we have um, one of the gypsy wagon, just like that one is my personal one for me and my family. And we have a, a luggable loo, bucket toilet, because we only need it at night, you know, when we can't go out to, you know, the campground or wherever um, to use the bathroom. So 
We use that, and you get them at Walmart for like 20 bucks. and it has a little uh, – has bags that are made to fit over the bucket and snap down under that toilet seat, and they have uh, like a powder in them, does the congeal thing and keeps the smell down. And then it uh, – when you're – after you've used it a few days, it kind of folds into itself, and then the sides come up, and then it has Ziploc shut with, with a double Ziploc, and you throw it away like a diaper. So uh, those are really handy and a cheap way to do it. Um, now, getting into uh, the flushing toilets, um, here are some differences. A regular residential toilet is great. Everybody likes them. They're comfortable. Um, they use a lot of water. So uh, if your water is not an issue, um, which it really always is, uh, you can use one of those. But the RV toilet is also a water flushing toilet, but it uses about a pint of water per flush. So what happens is... Um, if you have, hey Bill, can you bring me a sharpie and a and a piece? I got a piece of wood. Bill, can you bring me a sharpie? Okay, so I'll draw you a little diagram. So what happens is you get um, an RV toilet has a flap. Thank you, sir. So I'm going to do this. So if you have, okay, here's your regular toilet. If you look on a regular residential toilet, they have this little shape here underneath the bowl, right? And so what happens is water traps here. And it keeps air for the fumes from going back into the into the house. So um, that's what that big S shape is for. It's called a trap. Okay, so on an RV toilet, you don't have that. It just goes straight down into your sewage. Well, what keeps that smell and odor and fumes from coming up is you have a little flap here. And very often, they'll have like a little kickstarter here. It looks like a kickstarter on a motorcycle. Um, and what happens is you pull a lever. It fills some water in here. You do your business, and then you kickstart that thing and it opens that flap and the stuff goes down the flap goes back and keeps the fumes from coming up so it uses a lot less water to do the same thing uh, you just want to make sure that seal is always good on that on that flap because uh, that's a bad situation but there's there's the differences there so if you if you want to you can and most rv toilets will mount on the same flange as a residential toilet flange so what we do on ours is we put the uh, flange in the floor and plumb it all in uh, for a residential or RV toilet. And then if they want a compost toilet, we just build up two little half-inch pieces on either side. There's your flange. And we'll just do two little plastic half-inch pieces. And then we just mount the uh, compost toilet right over top of it. So you really, when we do them, we do all three um, scenarios uh, that you can use. But there's the differences. Water's not an issue, and you really like the comfort of a residential toilet, you can go that way. Um, if you want to conserve on water, if you're doing reclaimed water or you've got water catchment, um, you can go with the RV toilet if you don't want to deal with composting. Composting is great. If you're going to be somewhere, you're going to use it. I highly recommend it. That's the best use of that stuff. Um, and then uh, if you're just going to be trial and you're trying to keep from having to hook up, go with the uh, luggable loo or a kitty litter thing. And uh, that's – I don't know if there's anything – well, actually, there's incinerator toilets. I really don't. Even like mentioning those, the whole idea is just a bad joke. <laughs> but they, first of all, they require a, a 200 amp electrical service to run. Second of all, every report I ever read on them, they really, really stink, which makes sense. You're setting that stuff on fire. So uh, I don't recommend an incinerator toilet. There's also a, um, what do they call the no-flush one that has the bags, like the diaper genie. If you ever saw those, you, those of you had kids. Um, it has a little bag, and you go, and then it twists the thing around, and it goes again, makes, basically makes a bunch of link sausages of waste. And uh, after a while, that bucket's kind of full of these links, and then you just cut it off there, zip it, and you throw the whole thing away. I've heard those are really cool, and that would be great for traveling stuff, but the bag's really expensive, and there's not like an alternative you can use. So, um, yeah, there's the uh, the toilet thing. Um, roofs, uh, roof. Uh, lines and designs. Um, of course, we all have the dream of this super cutesy, charming um, uh, roof, you know, with the gables and the things over the bed and all that and the gingerbread and all that. And that's that's great. If that's what's important to you, just realize that you are trading off headspace, like headroom space in there for that. Um, also, possibly some structural integrity, um, you know, because you're adding more detail to it, which uh, makes it more complicated. So the roof lines are, are uh, important to make sure what's important to you and go with that. So uh, a lot of people like the industrial look or they want to do a rain catchment. So if you just have a single slope roof, which is just you know slanted from one side to the other, one slope, no peak or no gables, um, that's the most efficient one to do. It's strong. 
Um, you get a lot more headroom, and you can do rain catchment. You can put solar panels up there and still adjust them. Those are those are the uh, the best in my opinion as far as practicality. Now, I do like cutesy stuff too. So I mean, the rounded roof, as you see behind me, there, <laughs> the rounded roof on the gypsy wagon. Um, those are really cool too. Not everybody knows or has the skill to do those, um, but they're really strong. They're lightweight. Uh, first of all, they um, typically don't have any seams. Um, ours we can do uh, with no seam at all. We can do a 500 feet of it with no seam at all at eight, eight feet wide. Um, you, can, you can buy a <coughs> sheet aluminum. It's called Roll Roof. It's like a 63 gauge, really thick, and you can get it as long as you want. And so those are great, but you have to learn the technique of creating those arches and stuff. Um, but again, it's really strong. It's like the, the tin can concept. So you get a tin can, right, an empty tin can, and you try to twist it, and it doesn't really twist until you actually break the thing. So it's super lightweight, but it has an incredible strength. You can even stand up on these things. Um, if you balance yourself just right, and it won't crush. So same concept here. Like this, this gypsy here, won't. there's no twisting or torquing to it at all. So there's not seams that are going to weaken over time of travel. It just is what it is, and if you pick up one little corner of it, the whole thing just comes up. It doesn't twist or torque. So there's a, um, a benefit of the rounded roof or barrel roof. Um, so those are a great idea. If you want to learn how to do those, uh, I think I put some videos out on how we do those. If not, I can show you. I'm not going to keep the secrets. It's not a, not a big deal. It's just you do have to have some proper tools. You have to set up jigs. You have to have some sort of skill level to do it. Um, so, yeah, the rounded roofs are great. The the single slope roofs are ideal for maximizing on space and usability of that roof. Um, and then, of course, you get your super gingerbread gabled roofs with all the dormers and stuff. Um, of course, again, when you complicate things, you're, you're exposing yourself to uh, leaks and damages and things like that. But uh, having said that, I've done a bunch of them. Probably over half of my houses have been with those cute roofs because they're cute. I mean, we like it. We want to be happy. We want to feel comfortable in the house that we've we've chosen to live in, especially if it's small. And uh, that leads me to another thing is um, with the small houses, um, you know, a typical house, you know, regular residential home, uh, you know, they have a they have a full size fridge, they have a double sink, they have a whatever, they have a whatever. They all have the same list of things. So with a tiny house, you know you, and you know if you need all those things or not. So really. You just get what you absolutely need. And I build them. I've built ones that have big, you know, an 18 foot house that had a big elaborate kitchen in it because cooking was really important to them. They didn't care if they had a place to sit and eat it, but they did want to be able to cook it really nice. So put a big kitchen in there. And then I have people, I had uh, built a house for a guy that is like, listen, I don't cook. I don't do any of that stuff. I just basically need a sink and a place to make my sandwiches and open my beer. So, and even as far as the fridge, it's like, what's the smallest fridge I can get? Just put it on a shelf up over the sink, and that's that's all I need. So, realizing what it is you need, and 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 uh, just getting those things um, is really a, a key to figuring out how to live comfortably this way. Um, when my wife and I were hiking the Appalachian Trail, we had never listen. We had never backpacked before in our lives. We didn't even hear about it. We didn't even know that it existed. So. We heard about this 2,000 mile trail and thought, hey, that's a great idea. Let's go do it. But uh, the point I want to get to is we started out with all that. We had money back then. So we started out with all the highest tech gadgetry and the best top of the line equipment. And I had this cooking stove. It was titanium and it took these super, com super compressed gas canisters and you could use it in 20 below zero. And it had the little legs that popped out all titanium and stuff. It was a cool thing. I mean, it looked like I picked it up off the moon rover or something, and it was great. It was a great stove, and then after using it for a while, I was like, you know, it's a little complicated, a little heavy, and so I went down to um, this little can that had a, had a lid on it, and I forget the name of it, brand, but it used denatured alcohol. It had this cotton stuff in there and these little holes in a lid that sealed, and uh, you could put the denatured alcohol in there, and if it was really cold, you just kept it in your pocket for a while before you're going to cook, and it'll warm up that food. So that was great. Downsize, it was simpler, it was lighter, it was easier to use. I can get the fuel anywhere. And uh, even then, I was like, well, maybe I can go one step lower. And then somebody gave me a, a little stove made out of a Pepsi can. It was about this tall, about an inch tall, and the size was made out of two bottoms of uh, Pepsi cans. Had little pinholes in it, used to denature alcohol. I just had to measure how much I needed to boil how much water, but it weighed four grams. 
It weighed four grams. I still have it today. I got it like 12 years ago, and I still use it when I go traveling. And just knowing what you need and what you're comfortable with and just getting those things is going to make life so much easier. Now, one of the things that um, – and, and I re relate a lot of this stuff to backpacking because that's about as extreme as you can get um, as far as going minimalist. Um, so you have to have your you – know your boundaries. Know your comfort zones. Like for me in a tiny house, um, I need to have a comfortable seating area. I need to be able to have my feet kick up, recliner, or a nice ottoman or something. I need to be have a comfortable seat. So um, for me, that's what we make sure we have in our, in our house is a, is a nice comfortable seating area. As far as a bed, four-inch foam mattress is perfect for me. So know, know what's important to you. Um, like this, well, for instance, this gypsy wagon I'm building here in the back, or, well, they're building it. Uh, it's a, She's going to live in it full time. And she says, you know, one of the things important to me is I have to have a soft, soft, comfy bed. And so we're actually accommodating by doing, going to do a regular single mattress for her, and then going to do like a pillow, like a down, goose down topper on there and stuff like that. But that's important. But you know what? She doesn't even need a toilet. She's going to use the bucket. we got a shower in there, just a little 32-inch shower. That was fine to her. That's all she needed. She said, you know what? I don't even want a couch in there. I don't even want a chair. I'm just going to have a little folded chair open up. So she knows what's important to her. You know, and we may um, – well, here's – I did a 16-foot house for a young couple. Um, and 16-foot house, that is not big. It's like 110 square feet. Uh, but what they were really adamant about was they wanted a garden tub. A garden tub and a 16-foot house, but they knew that's what was important to them, that and a full-size fridge and a 16-foot house. So we had to give them a wet bath, which only took four-foot by two-foot area. So the bathroom was small, and they, were, they knew that that was fine with them. They didn't need anything bigger than that. So the bed lifted up on hydraulics and exposed a full-size, two-person jacuzzi garden tub in it. So it was, uh, it was crazy, but they knew what was important to them. So as a result, they were able to live very comfortably in a 16 foot house. So that's uh, make sure you realize and be, and be realistic with yourself. Don't say, Oh, I can do without anything. Um, try it, you know, go uh, spend a night. You know, we let people spend a night here in our houses and gypsies all the time, you know, that are, you know, considering buying one um, just to see how they like it and what's important to them. And inevitably they always come out with different ideas than they went in with. So uh, there's plenty of like Airbnb rentals now available. There's people that'll let you stay in their house. So, Take advantage of those. You know, it's worth a plane ticket. If you have to fly down to Siesta Key or somewhere to, to uh, stay in one, they got a whole bunch of them down there um, to rent out. I would say always always do that in any opportunity. Um, another thing is very often in building traditional homes, uh, they say most people have to build three houses before they really get it dialed in the way they want it. So um, I hear it all the time. People, oh, this is the last house I'm going to own, so I want to make it right. Um, just be careful of that statement. Don't set yourself up for disappointment. Just be realistic and um, be prepared to, if you have to sell it, to upgrade or downgrade or, or whatever. Uh, just be prepared to uh, make some changes to it and, and be okay with that. Uh, and life does happen. It changes. You know, people get married, have babies, and, you know, tides change and earthquakes and whatever. So just be open to, you know, we have the dream, but if we set ourselves up for um, if if what's happening in my life doesn't fit every one of these, you know, slots in my dream board, um, I'm going to be unhappy. You know, make sure that you're not basing your happiness on just your tiny house alone, but the freedom that it's going to allow. And that'll actually make you feel a whole lot more comfortable about your living conditions. You know, when we're hiking the Appalachian Trail, sleeping on a three-quarter inch thin uh, foam pad in the snow was not ideal sleeping conditions, but waking up in the morning, having a cup of coffee, overlooking a beautiful mountain range, was pretty darn worth it. So, and when you've hiked 22 miles during the day, you get sleepy enough to pretty much sleep on anything. So, yeah. Um, go ahead. So, uh, I've been interested in the diversity of ages of people who come to our local tiny house meetup group and yeah. who are signing up for the summit. Yeah. Do you find that there's a really wide people? I think people assume that the tiny house movement is a young person's movement, but that doesn't seem to be the case for me. Yeah. Well, you know, it, and that's a good point to bring up. You know, I've actually built one for a 13 year old and for a 72 year old. So, and everything in between. So, I think it's anybody that's willing to, to realize that, hey, there's something different than the status quo here. 
And uh, yeah, you're right. You know, and at those events, we're always surprised at the the type of people. You know, because a lot of uh, folks look at us as like the big, the, you know, the new hippie generation. You know, all, we're all just gonna wear flowers and dance around at you know tiny house fest, and that's fun. I like it. But um, the fact of the matter is, we got there's a pro baseball player. I mean, he's a millionaire who lives in a tiny house, 250 square feet. There are um, business executives. I get uh, traveling nurses. You get uh, retired people raising their grandkids. You get you get the whole thing really, and and it's it fits. It just fits. It fits anybody that's willing to um, realize what they can gain by doing it or what they're losing by not doing it. So yeah, it's a very good point to bring up, and and also as an encouragement to you out there, you might be saying, oh, I'm too old to go up and down a ladder. Well, don't get a house that has the bedroom on the bottom floor. You know, we're not limited to what we see on TV. You know, everything I build is custom. They're, they're all different. Every single one I build is different to some degree. Um, even our little campers and stuff, there's always a little variation of some sort, you know. Um, I built a 20-foot single-level tiny house for a, a lady who has two nephews that spend time with her, and they're both seven feet tall. So we had to make sure <laughs> they had room to get around in there and use the facilities and whatnot. So... Yeah, it's it's a it's a wide wide range. I mean, look, it's it's opening up the world again. Going back to my point of if you're okay, well, let's look at the electric bill alone. Twenty eight dollars a month. The average electric bill, you know, the average electric bill on our tiny house has been about twenty two. So, and the average electric bill in the country right now in a in a traditional home is two twenty, I believe, or two sixty. So, I mean, a fraction of the cost. The money you save in your just the electric bill alone. The money you save in your electric bill alone over the course of a year is going to pay for uh, Alaskan cruise for two, a family reunion, um, a mission trip to wherever, buy a well for somebody in a village that doesn't have any water. Um, you can really start making a difference. You can really start making things happen. You know, go down to the Arnold Palmer hospital and, and spend a, a couple holidays down there and, and bring stuff, bring gifts, bring food, whatever. Do something. You know, we don't feel better about ourselves when we have a bigger house. We feel better about ourselves when we have a bigger life. You know, and when that impacts people on a positive note. In what, way, in what ways is this a fad, and in what ways is it not? Um, you know, I think like anything, there's there's the attraction of something new and different, and and also um, a lot of people are looking. Uh, I mean, we're a social network, you know, country now. You know, everything's social networking. So whatever is seeming like it's cool everywhere else, um, we want to kind of check it out and see. Um, why it's cool and if we can be cool like them too. Um, but I think I think there's very little of it that's a fad. I mean, obviously there's gonna be people that try it and, and realize, yeah, I just I just can't do it. And and again, get back to being realistic with yourself about that. Um, but I, I don't think there's a lot of fad about it at all. I think it's I think it's very solid. I think it's here to stay. I think it solves too many issues, answers too many questions. I mean, I'm getting calls from senators and governors. Um, you know, I've been on three different TV networks now, on um, three different shows. Um, and I'm, I'm just a guy in Florida building stuff. So it's not like I'm, you know, super Hollywood and they're looking at me to do stuff. It's just it, people are eating it up because it is a good solution. It really is a good solution in, in, in any, any aspect. So you've mentioned freedom, sort of personal freedom, uh, time freedom, financial freedom. Yeah. The, the do-it-yourself side of this, uh, how big an issue is this for people to, to feel like they actually can accomplish something themselves? They're willing to go through the work just to be able to say, I did it. Right. Yeah, that's, that's good too. Um, and this is where like, um, and I can't speak for the others because I don't know them personally. I, I am one of the founders of Noah Certified, so I know that that company. Um, so if you're going to do it yourself, if you go through them, they have a program for DIYers. Um, we have um, helplines. We have uh, um, information online, videos. Um, you can actually call. Um, you know, I got you know hundreds of people that call me personally on my own cell phone all the time, every day, um, just for like, hey, you know, what kind of light fixtures do you use, or what kind of hurricane strapping should I put here, or can I, you know, can I leave her over that? Um, and that's where that's where that company comes in handy and, and tying yourself in with um, uh, American Tiny House Association or with NOAA Certified or you know and any of those 
those groups really um but the the NOAA certification you can actually have an inspected by licensed insured inspectors every stage of the build so if you do your wiring you know if you do it yourself you buy a book I mean that's how I learned you know I just I, I bought a book I went to actually I went to the library and checked out a book I was like wiring can't be that darn hard so checked out a book and I learned how to do wiring and got ended up being a good electrician <laughs> um, you know so we get inspections by like I said by licensed inspectors and um, so if you did something wrong, they're going to catch and say, Hey, listen, you got that wire on the wrong side. You need to put it over there. So you don't, you know, shock yourself. So that's a good, a good, um, backup, uh, peace of mind. It's not that expensive. Um, it's a really good peace of mind to know that, you know, um, qualified engineers and electricians and inspectors are looking at your work. Um, and they don't have to come to you to do it. You don't have to worry about the demographic of, you know, hey, I live in the in the mountains. You know, of you know, I live in South Dakota, or wherever. You know, if you live somewhere far away, um, it's all done remotely. So they can do it right from your phone. You just point it at what they want to look at, and they'll say, hey, I need you to zoom in on that electrical panel, and they'll snapshot it, and they'll. And if there's something in question, uh, like we've come across this, like a engineering aspect of a cantilever, somebody building out. Um, past their trailer frame, um, we we run it by engineers and say, okay, your engineer said it's good. If you put a brace in here, go ahead forward, you're good to go. Um, so that's a really good resource for that. And that brings up another point: if you're going to build a 28 foot house, don't buy a 24 foot trailer and just think you're going to build it over on each end. Just buy the right size trailer frame. Um, this is the foundation. It's just like if you were to pour a concrete slab to build a house on, and then you said, well, I think I want it two feet longer on both sides. You know, just going to hang it over the dirt. Just, just don't do it. Um, just buy the right size trailer and build it on there. It's going to distribute the weight right. You've got some balancing issues there. Axles, the balance in the center of the axles is typically 60% back from the front of the trailer. So, And it's that way for a reason. So make sure that. And that also brings up another point. Um, people worry a lot about weight. You know, They say, oh, how can I build a lightweight, tiny house? Well, you're building a house. So um, be concerned about other things first. And then uh, go ahead and let it be heavy. You know, it's it's not. I mean, we have some lightweight designs for people that are traveling. You know, towable tinies. Um, but but really, if if you're if you don't have to have it lightweight for a reason, just get a bigger truck. Um, and just just build it solid, build it stout. Uh, one of the things that that helps a lot uh, when I was talking about the construction at moving, going on quarters and stuff is. Um, a lot of times people will have their sheathing, their OSB or zip panel, whatever they're using, and they'll slap it up and they'll nail it on, which is fine in a traditional construction. But in a tiny house, you want to make sure you're using some liquid nails or glue and gluing that to it and then screw it. Um, what happens is if you have a um, you have a nail going through a, a wall here, so it makes a hole, right? And if that thing gets shaken and wiggled around a bit, that nail wiggles around and makes that hole slightly bigger. And then that nail can become loose. Um, and it happens in floors. You ever see like uh, wooden floors that creak and squeak when you step on them? It's because those nails come loose. And eventually, every time you step, that nail goes in and out. It makes a, you know, you got a little violin going on there squeaking on your floor. Um, so, and, and a nail has a, mostly a shear strength. So when you put a nail in there, it's keeping something from moving this way. Um, it has some pull this way, but not as much as what they call a shear strength. So um, if you're putting your sheathing on it, so if you're going to do your glue and then you put a screw through, that screw is going to actually tighten down and pinch down. It has a grab strength. So it's going to pull it nice and tight and make that glue hold really good. But also if it wiggles around, it doesn't just make the hole bigger and it come out. It has those, uh, you know, the, the spiral on it, the screw part of it. So that actually creates a little lip in the wood there that keeps it from being able to just pull out. So not required but it's just a just a, a tip that'll help you do a better job on something that's going to last a lot longer awesome so um are there any other things that you would want to communicate to someone who's interested in tiny houses but doesn't kind of know where to start yeah yeah i get that i get that a lot uh people are like man how, what do i do to start what do i do to start the process um and May sound silly, but Pinterest will get you going. Uh, things like that. YouTube, will, you'll see a lot of stuff. Get the inspiration first, and then let the create creativity and the necessities follow. Um, you just again, you want to keep that vision and keep your inspiration going um, for this journey. And it is a journey. I mean, you're gonna change your life, your whole life, and and hopefully uh, change other people's lives with your with your freedom from this. So yeah, I would say start there. Um, 
spend a night in one somewhere. Get a little bit of a feel for it. Talk to people that are living tiny already. There's there's a dozen documentaries or shows, uh, all kinds of stuff. There's communities you can go and talk to people. Most people are willing to just open the door. If you knock on the door of a tiny house, very few people will go go away. You know, they they want to uh, they want to help again. And that's what I've been saying from the beginning is everybody wants to help. So make a phone call, start talking about it. Get in a tiny house if you can. Um, spend a night in one if you can or a weekend would be a really good idea uh, talk to your family if you're if you're like with, with me and my kids both my kids are adopted so we were required a certain amount of square footage per child by the state um, but now we're, we're past that point so now we can consider going back tiny again and uh, so we talked to our kids about it you know my wife and I talked about it we talked to our kids I mean we live small we're not you know we're like 700 square feet or something but um so what we do is we talk to them, and we camp a lot. We'll go out in our gypsy wagon, and we'll say, hey, what will we have to add to the gypsy wagon for you guys to live in there um, full time? And, you know, they're pretty easy. Kids are easy. They're very adjustable. Um, you know, everybody thinks, you know, this. it seems like this just happened in the last few years is uh, that everybody feels like every child in their family has to have their own bedroom. I mean, I don't know when that happened, but I hear it all the time now. Couples are like, oh, well, we need to move to a bigger house. We need a five-bedroom. I think, why do you need five bedrooms? We only have three kids. And they say, well, we need our room. We need a guest room. And each kid has to have their own room. Not necessarily so. I don't know if that's a shocker to anybody out there, but kids don't always have to have their own room. Um, <laughs> you know, when I grew up, I've got eight brothers and a sister. We lived in about a thousand square foot house. So if you do the math, it gets down to tiny house living, basically. <laughs> and uh, I turned out okay. A couple of glitches. But, <laughs> but they, uh, I mean, we had literally, okay, here's one scenario when I was growing up. We had a laundry room that connected the kitchen to the, to the uh, master bedroom. So it was a, you had to go through it all the time. And uh, in that laundry room, we had a washer and dryer. We were one of the fortunate families. And so we had a washer and dryer, but we also had a set of bunk beds in that laundry room, okay? And there were three of us on the bottom bunk and two on the top. And uh, we did okay. We did okay. It wasn't the end of the world. We didn't, we didn't even have a room, let alone our own room. We didn't even have our own laundry room. We shared it. It was five of us in there. So it's uh, – it, and then we moved to a house that had a garage, and we literally hung a sheet across so we can separate and have two more rooms in the garage, but it was in Florida with no air conditioning, so that kind of sucked, but we're still happy to have the uh, space. But you you would adjust and adapt. You know, actually, that may be why I'm so small. You know, they say that the fish only grow to the size of the tank. I may, be, I may have been stunted. That could have been the cause for yours truly, the tiny, tiny house guy. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we'll never know because uh, it's too late. I'm not going to have a ghost for it. So I think we finished there. <laughs> 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 there thank we you, go. Man. Well, listen, just I want to thank you for listening. I hope I've helped you. I hope I've encouraged you. And uh, reach out, ask, ask for help, and um, talk to people. It's it's worth the effort. It really is worth the effort. A little bit of a fight logistically in some areas, but it's worth the effort. I can guarantee it. I mean.